I'll start with a few things. The first one, as you can see if you're, you can read French, at the bottom there, it won uh, the Prix de Premier Roman, which is the first novel award uh, in France from last year. Uh, that's kind of a big deal, as you might imagine. Um, but it's also interesting because I can't think of another book set in Hong Kong that's won that kind of overseas award. And I've been sort of thinking about this all day and I really can't think of another one. It's probably the only Hong Kong book that's won an award of that magnitude, certainly the only one I can think of. Um, and the second thing I'll say is that my own French dates from 40 years ago from high school, almost 40 years ago, which is somewhat depressing, really. Um, but I have read the book, um, and it's really not very hard. So if you have any French at all, you can probably read it. So you shouldn't be put off by the fact that the book is in French. Um, read the book in a dictionary and you'll get through it without too much difficulty. So don't let the fact that it's in French uh, dissuade you from doing it. All right, I, let's start. You, perhaps you can start by telling us why you're here. How'd you get here? Yes, I, I'd like to, first of all, thank you all for being here. I'd like to thank uh, the Hong Kong Trade and Development uh, Council for uh, this uh, invitation. Uh, I'd like to thank Peter also uh, for accepting to be the moderator of this session. And um, yes, the, the, maybe the best is to start uh, to try to explain my relationship with Hong Kong. Uh, I went uh, to Hong Kong um, maybe 15 years ago, for the first time, and uh, something happened I still try to understand. I, f uh, I felt such a special connection. I fall in love, somehow, with this city. And maybe one of the reasons I, uh, I, tr I wrote that book is to explain that connection. So really, it's a praise of this city, this book, my first book, my first novel, uh, is set in Hong Kong, and like I think any first book, it's a kind of self-portrait, but it was very important for me to, me as a French guy, to set up this self-portrait in Hong Kong. So uh, when I first traveled to Hong Kong for the first time, I was a, a music composer. I did a few uh, uh, feature films in France, and at that time, it happens that uh, the music I was composing was for uh, uh, a, a film called Augustin Roi du Kung Fu, Augustin King of Kung Fu, starring uh, Maggie, Ma Maggie Chung. And uh, so I, ha I had that, that opportunity to, to work and to meet Maggie, uh, but at that time, I didn't know Hong Kong. And Suddenly, I had the opportunity to come here and to stay each time, not a few days, but um, some, some weeks, three weeks, one month. And today, I have some relatives living in Hong Kong, living in Ripples Bay. So that's my relationship built over the year uh, uh, with Hong Kong. Um, Somehow, I felt I wanted to invite, uh, invent uh, um, a life for myself in Hong Kong. I was not able to create in real life, but I wanted to, come to, to write something about a possible life in Hong Kong. So that's one of the subject of the, of the book. I'm going to ask Olivia to read something uh, in a minute from the book, give us a start. But before I do that, maybe you can give us a short outline of what the book's about. Uh, yes. Not the whole story, because we want people to read the book, but just, just the beginning part. Yes, that's the part I always try to avoid, to do the pitch. Because I have the feeling that when you do the pitch, you don't say anything about your real project. You just tell a plot, 
but at the same time, a plot is important in a book. So l let's do it. It's, uh, you, you, it's a kind of love story set up between a, a, a French guy coming from a professional mission, very vague, isn't it, Peter? <laughs> and uh, with a, a, a Chinese actress uh, called Beverly, she's married to an um, uh, American businessman. They have a kid. She's a kind of rising star. And this man, the, 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 his name is Carter, his dream is to make, to transform his wife into a global, international star. Is, um, is, um, he needs his wife to be seen, seen in the, the eyes of the public, in the eyes of other men. And so it's a kind of a destiny she has to fulfill. And she feels that she has to do this. She's not exactly happy because she's living in the cold uh, order of a uh, representation, and suddenly she met Pierre, and she felt the right to have access to love and intimacy. But she's still uh, uh, caught between uh, uh, the destiny she has to fulfill and the love she wants to live with that guy. So it's a kind of conflict of loyalty. So the book is around the th these uh, three characters. Pierre, the French guy, Carl Carter, the American businessman, and his wife, Beverly. Basically, that's the story. So, should we start? Yes. I start to read. Start to read. In, start English. in English. So this is the, the very difficult part for me. I'm going to try to read in English. Excuse my French. I had for a long time wanted to live in Asia. This desire ended up occupying a considerable portion of my consciousness, growing on its own without my realizing it. The arrangement for my departure and relocation were all of a sudden complete without my being able to say exactly how such particular set of chance events had managed to happen, as if it were an underground stream emerging into the light, the blurred vision of another existence had found its channel and washed away my whole life. It's tempting to say that this is what I wanted. For two weeks, I have been living alone in a large, almost empty flat in a four-story building just 50 meters from the sea. The cul-de-sac where it sits it is filled with luxury cars, and right at the end of the this drive is a metal gate for which I have the key. It opens on a pathway leading directly to the sea. Early each morning, all Chinese gentlemen come to take their daily swim. On floating platform, anchored by cables, we exchange polite smiles before diving into the South China Sea. I always swim out, of, out to the anti-shark net to take in the view of a crescent-shaped bay and the wooded hillside on which stand large buildings several dozen stories high. The lifeguard on their observation towers arrange along the beach never takes their eyes off the swimming area. Their immobility gives me the impression that they are meditating, that they become, thanks to some quality of particular focus, one with their surroundings. Red life severs hang in clear view from the concrete struts that support the platform of each tower. Closer to the shore, a plastic rod delimits an area of the beach reserved for the, reserved for the lifeguards. As noted on the beach information panel, a rescue board rests on the edge of the sea, watched by the surf. And standing on a raft, equipped with oars and umbrella, a lifeguard in 
orange and red uniform slowly navigates a sea as calm as a lake. On the horizon, the endless run of container ships entering and leaving the port of Hong Kong provides rhythm to the, pana to the panorama of Ripple's Bay. You're going to turn over to me? What? Can I continue? Please. Okay. I, I, I have to say that this translation was made by Peter, especially for this event. So thank you very much, Peter. So if you don't like, like it, it's my fault. <laughs> While coming back from the beach, I meet a young Asian woman in the hall of the building. She has a child in her arms and is making to leave. I open the door, she thanks me, asks if I live here, and mention that she lives one floor down from me. Her voice, the words she uses, her expressions betray study and control. Everything about her indicates that she is well aware of the effect she has. And then there is this fear that beats desperately on the surface of her youth while there is still time. Just then, I think that seeing her age would be trying. She looks at me intently and says to be careful of the lightning which the weatherman had predicted for the day. Her warning has something incongruous about it, troubling, as if it reveals some mysterious goings on. Once back in my flat of Mahogany Parquet, the, the cessation of strangeness persists quite some time before it goes away. I'm going to skip. At dawn, I leave the apartment building, turn right towards the small iron gate, passing on one side the Mercedes, the Maseratis, the Porsches, and on the other a cement drainage canal buried in vegetation where some cabins crumble, eaten by humidity. I'm attracted by these abandoned burrows as a general answer to the question of existence. We might call this the temptation, the temptation of the whole, <clears throat> to make a life in a hole. My mind is accustomed to these expansions and contractions, the temptation to exist is balanced by another, at least equal, to disappear. I go towards the gate, fighting the desire to melt into this decayed background. In the water, detritus floats under the surface. Yesterday's storm, no doubt. I swim to escape whatever it is that is blocking up my mind. Upon leaving the water, I observe a slight oily film on my skin. The sultry human heat accentuates the stickiness. I hurry back to take a shower. Just as I enter the building's lobby, a car comes too quickly up the drive, bounces gently on its suspension, and stops in the middle of the ground level parking area. She exits the car without cutting the engine, leaving the door open. She hurries towards the back stairs. She hasn't seen me. The contents of a makeup bag are scattered on the passenger seat. I lean into the car, a hand on the steering wheel. I choose a black lacquer powder compact. Shortly after, I open the small box. In the, layer of, in the fine layer of material deposited on the surface of the mirror recessed in the cover, a finger has traced what seem to be two, two Chinese characters. I ask the building's gardener what they mean. Do you know how to pronounce this? My wife told me. Jiao, jiao, in Chinese. In Cantonese, jiao, it, my wife told me jiao, what it was. Jiao, put some gas. Put some gas in the tank. Jai, gai yao. Gaiyao. My wife told me, but I forgot. Gaiyao, he tells me without. You put it in Mandarin, not in Cantonese. This is what threw everybody. <laughs> so, Gaiyao, he tells me without smiling. Let's go, come on, fill up the petrol tank. I slide the compact into an envelope with a message written on a page from my diary. This belongs to you. So far, I have avoided the lightning, your neighbor. I leave the envelope by her door. I see her sitting on the sand. I haven't any doubt that she is there for me. I go towards her as if I'm following instructions memorized long ago. With the slightest of gestures, she invites me to sit, to her, sit, to her, sit next to her facing the sea. Her legs are bare, bent, held, slightly to, held tightly together, her feet together on the sand, her hands crossed on her knees. She seats upright, looking in front of her at the sea and the sky. The tendons in her neck are prominent as if defiant. Her black hair falls over her shoulders, framing a face hidden by sunglasses and a large hat. She thanks me for having found the compact. She emphasizes the word found. She asks me if I have ever felt under the influence of a curse. I'm not at first certain that I have understood her, her smile and ease being at odds with her words. I answer that the worst curses are those we place on ourselves, all the while thinking that I 
best keep quiet. Her name is Beverly Carter. Do you work in Hong Kong? Sometimes, she replies. And what's your profession? I am my own profession. I congratulate her on this crucial choice. Now the tone between us has been irrevocably set. We stay a bit longer on the beach in order to warily touch up the form of our encounter. I'm going to uh, jump forward a bit more. He's been invited to join them at the American Club. So it's about a page later on. There are only professionals in this world. Recreation at the American Club is more demanding than work, excellent since 1925. Like walking onto the set of a television reality show where everyone knows with complete certainty the role he has to play. A small piece of American happiness on the shore of the South China Sea. They wait for me at one of the tables on the terrace overlooking the water. They are a spectacular couple. They are an exact representation of what humanity pursues. They must appear sublime even in their own eyes. The invitation to join them and sit with them places me apart from the rest of mankind. The air is charged with their erotic presence and images of ideal romantic couplings. Carter is in the prime of life at the peak of his powers. What is his life and whence this power? I feel a bit theoretical sitting next to him. He has that physique unique to Americans that admits no doubt. Instructions made, Carter informs me, I am in entertainment. We are all in entertainment to some extent. Life is so serious. Carl Carter has big plans for Asia, that is to say, for the world. I'm at the center of the machine, he says. These millions of containers that pass in front of our eyes, that's entertainment. They come directly from a story that someone once made up and that others have started to believe. And if there were nothing in those containers passing by on the water, I ask, nothing, nothing at all, try to imagine. It's a hypothesis, empty containers that sail from port to port without a final destination. It's a hypothesis, he said. I sometimes have the feeling that someone is about to push me in the back, that I will tip into the void. I don't mean that what you do is pointless, quite the contrary. Before dinner, I'd went onto the internet to look up what I could about Carl Carter. He set himself up in Hong Kong to, among other things, recycle the ideas and talent of the local cinema on behalf of American studios. He assesses the feasibility of remakes by tutting up costs of adaptation and rights. This usually leads to pale copies, cultural counterfeits, a sort of poetic justice. And, th and through his production company, he also advises several institutions, including then the US Army, which is never content to leave the, the entertainment industry to its own devices. He's almost a colleague. So just turning right to the end. Those pages don't seem to be in the right order. Do you have yours? So you missed a page. <coughs> oh, no, it is fine. It's fine, sir. <coughs> so he goes back. And with a half smile, which I believe betray the pleasure she takes in the situation, Beverly changes the subject. So, mysterious neighbor, what have you come looking for on the dragon's back? I'm a consultant. My clients keep me on a very long leash. Carter says he often has business with people like me. I'm not at all sure what he meant. He dives into his blackberry. The man has a brutality which excites his wife. She trembles with a slight air of embarrassment. The conversation fell like a dropped plate. I watch Beverly's face and all the feelings she has already ignited suddenly unite into an emotion I am at pains to hide. She gets up to greet a friend who has come into the restaurant. I can't take my eyes off her. <clears throat> Carter takes the opportunity to whisper, she's something, isn't she? I rediscover this every time someone like you looks at her like that. Beverly turns around and for one short moment targets her eyes at the pathetic pair we make. So I hope that gives you uh, some flavor of the book. Um, it's a bit different in French, obviously. Now, where are my notes? <clears throat> when you were, we, we cheated, because we had a talk beforehand, so 
I prepared myself a little bit. But when, when we were talking beforehand, you mentioned that uh, Hong Kong for you was as much a character in the book as any of the people. Yes, in fact, as I said, uh, I think the main character of my book is the city of Hong Kong. I chose to uh, put uh, a quotation uh, at the beginning of my book. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read it in English and uh, in French and then in a, tr try to translate it in English. It's from a very famous French writer called Georges Perec. And he said, Nous ne pourrons jamais expliquer ou justifier la ville. La ville est là. Elle est notre espace et nous n'en avons pas d'autre. I try to translate. We will never have, we, we, we cannot uh, explain or justify the city. The city is there, it's our space, and we will never have another one. I felt a real fasc fascination about Hong Kong. I could not explain, as I told you. And I tried to personify this fascination uh, through uh, the, the female character of Beverly. My, my relationship to Hong Kong is possible because uh, I think here, and maybe this is one of the only places in Asia I can feel that, that women have a special place. They have their special rights. They are strong. They are able to take care of themselves, like in France. And I want to live in this world where women are equal to men. That's very important in my relationship to uh, Hong Kong. There's many, place, many places in Asia where I don't feel so comfortable. But here in Hong Kong, I can feel I can share the same value. There is a lot of cultural democratic values here, history. There is a lot of uh, history about feminism also. Women are equally part of the society. That's very important. So the character of Beverly is a very strong modern day woman but she's living into a conflict, which can happen to anyone, between her, the sense of her destiny, the sense she has to fulfill this destiny wanted by uh, her husband, and the, um, her will to be happy and to be also a mother. That's part of the, of the story. And maybe it's the right time to explain a little bit the source of uh, the story. Um, it's coming from a very, very old story uh, called the story of the King Candol, Le Roi Candol. King Candol was a, a, a Greek king uh, living uh, eight century before uh, our era. It's, he was married to the most beautiful woman he was convinced that he was married, married to the most uh, beautiful woman in the world. And he wanted to show this beauty to some other man. He asked to uh, his uh, um, captain of his guard to hide inside the bedroom of the queen, behind a curtain, and to watch her when she's going to bed. The queen, um, um, the day after, asked the guard to come and said, I know you were here yesterday. I'm going to, I should kill you because you humiliate me. But I know exactly who asked you to uh, do so. It's my husband, so I give you the choice. I ask my own guard to kill you, or you're going, you're going to kill 
my husband. At the end, that's what he, 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 he did. His name was uh, Jesus, and he killed the king, the king and become, became uh, uh, the new king. This story was told by Herodot and was Herodotus. And um, it has a lot of erotic power. So you can, uh, you can uh, find this story in uh, dif different uh, French writers, in a lot of paintings. Uh, you can see the representation of King Candol uh, wanting his wife to be seen by another man. We, we can call that uh, maybe, a, I don't know, a, a disease, or we can call that a fantasy, or we can call that, I don't know, but it was, it is part of the story I try to tell. You know, the, the, the place of a producer or a, a director is very often is in love with the actress, maybe he's living a, a love story with the actress, but at the same time, he's asking to uh, the woman he loves to be kissed by another man in front of the camera, in front of the crew. So it's that kind of... Um, um, obsession and fascination I try to describe in the story of my book. That's wa that was one of the, the main inspiration of the story uh, of, uh, of uh, Beverly, Pierre and, and Carter. And there's one phrase that you, that you have. Oh, yeah. Which, let me, I skip this bit, so I will read it now. <clears throat> Just two paragraphs, and then I will ask Olivier to read it in French, if you don't mind. There's that one paragraph. Uh, partly so you can hear the French, because it's quite different. He's, uh, the, 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 the narrator has gone out to the town. He's gone to Kowloon side. And uh, he's going up into the, um, the Peninsula Hotel. I walk towards the hotel with a smile on my lips. I'm already anticipating the spectacle that awaits me. And I slip hastily by the luxuries of this establishment for the rich. In the lift which goes directly to the 28th floor, the light changes color as it rises. It is an introduction to the small narcissistic drama of the bar and the visual shock of the skyline. Standing in front of the bay windows, I post myself by the empty verticality. I let myself drift into the scene, sucked in by fluidity of the physical limits. I have never felt more aware of the contours of an interior space than when allowing my mind to float over the harbor. I give a thought to Leslie Chung, the depressive Hong Kong star who jumped from the 24th floor of the Mandarin Hotel, just over there, on the other side of the harbor. Why must it be like this, concluded the note that was found on his glamorous and broken body. I recognize the first notes of the J.J. Johnson song, She Doesn't Live Here Anymore. One only embraces at arm's length, which is a phrase we'll discuss in a minute. A reflection in the window recalls to me the interior of the bar, Hong Kong women affect a classical dress sense that strikes my fancy. I pretend not to notice a well-appointed Chinese woman in the group. She is all of a different world, scintillatingly sexual. I feel a sense of freedom that I have not felt for a long time. Here, the die has not yet been cast. The slight science fictional vertigo induced by the city has created in me a certain desire of desire and arousal. Here, I shall live. So can you do that paragraph? Debout devant les baies, les baies vitrées, je me pose à la verticale du vide. Je me laisse dériver dans le panorama, aspiré par la fluidité des limites. Jamais je ne sens davantage les contours d'un espace intérieur qu'en laissant mon esprit flotter sur la baie. J'ai une pensée pour Leslie Chung, Hong Kong star dépressive, sautant du 24e étage du mandarin oriental, là-bas de l'autre côté de la baie. Faut-il qu'il en soit ainsi Concluait la note qu'on a trouvée sur son corps glamour et fracassé Je reconnais les premières notes de la chanson de J.J. Johnson, « She doesn't live here anymore ». On n'embrasse jamais que de loin. Un reflet sur la vitre me rappelle à l'intérieur du bar. Les femmes de Hong Kong affichent un classicisme vestimentaire qui satisfait mon imaginaire. Je feins d'ignorer une grande chinoise très entourée. Elle est tout un monde lointain, le sentiment du sexuel. 
J'éprouve un sentiment de liberté que je n'ai pas ressenti depuis très longtemps. Ici, les jeux ne sont pas faits. Le léger vertige de science-fiction que procure la ville a créé en moi un état particulier d'éveil et de désir. Ici, je vais vivre. So I hope that convinces you to read the original. Um, but there's that one phrase, on embrasse, what is it? <coughs> que de loin. On n'embrasse jamais que de loin. Que de, que de loin. This was the one, uh, when I sent him the translation, he said, well, it's not bad, but he made one big mistake. <laughs> so, and that was the phrase I got wrong. And um, the word in French, embrasser, is a little bit like English. It means to embrace. Uh, it also means to kiss in French, which is a little bit complicated. But it means to embrace people, but also to embrace as you would embrace a view or to embrace a scene or something like that. Uh, but yeah, you have exactly. a very particular meaning for this. Uh, yeah, when people ask me if there was a sentence I should keep from the book, just one sentence, I always say, on n'embrasse jamais que de loin. Uh, because it's a bit of the tragic of the position of uh, my uh, protagonist. Um, when you hold someone in your arm, you cannot see the person anymore. If you want to, um, if you want to, to see the person, if you want to see the person moving, living, you need to step back behind. And we men, especially, we have that uh, relationship to women. We, we like to watch women. We like, we like the, we are in, the, in that kind of fascination with uh, woman beauty. And we always need at one point to uh, cut the intimacy order to come back to the representation. We need to see the women we love. We, men, we, we need to see almost her on stage. That's something I try to, to describe in that book. That particular movement of, I need to step back to let maybe the desire come. Uh, it's that type of movement which makes life and desire. But for some men, and I think it's like a curse, uh, for some men it's almost impossible to stay in the intimacy. They always want, and maybe the directors, maybe the producers are this type of men, they always want the woman to be in a distance. So that, that sentence, on n'embrasse jamais que de loin, is a game on the, the word embrasser, like you said, to embrace the landscape, and at the same time, to kiss. And when I think to my relationship to that city, in fact, you know, I have absolutely no special uh, authority or special skills or special expertise about Hong Kong. I'm not one of those foreigners who's going to live two weeks here or two years and is going to explain to you, Hong Kong people, uh, what the city is about. That's, I have no skills about that and no pretension about that. My only skills, my only expertise is to love this, this city. And that, that's something really particular because in a way, when you meet someone or meet something that you really like, you are, you are able to say that crazy sentence, you belong to me. It's absolutely crazy to say that to someone. You belong to me. But that's the way you feel sometime in life. You want to say to someone, you belong to me. That's, it, the meaning is not, you're my property. That's not that. It means that I feel so connected to you that you're part of my world. And somehow that's what I feel with Hong Kong. I feel home. Hong Kong is not a, an exotic background for me. I have absolutely no interest for uh, exotism. To me, Hong Kong, and maybe there is a more rational uh, way to explain that feeling, because Hong Kong is a big city, it's part of this uh, global uh, urban culture that you can feel all over the world. 
uh, whether you're in, um, I don't know, New York, uh, Seoul, uh, Paris, uh, Kyoto, whatever. It's part of this urban culture where you can find easily your uh, repère. How do you say repère? Sorry for this question. <laughs> so where, where, where you can find, uh, where you can feel at your ease. So maybe it's, that's one of the explanation. But there's something more mysterious uh, about the way I, I feel just home. So that's why to explain to myself, first of all, this feeling, I wrote this book, probably. I think I'll open the floor to questions now. I have some more of my own, but uh, I don't want to monopolize it. If not, someone's written them down. Oh, I've been told that if you ask questions, two attendees asking questions will get their two free copies of the book available. That's a bribe to get you to ask questions. <laughs> But if not, I'll, I will keep on. Um, sorry? Question there. I don't, need, I don't get the book if I ask questions. I've already read it. Um, I'm a translator too, and so I'm very curious to know whether the author has read the translation in full and how does it feel? The, the full translation is about 2,000 words. So I didn't do the, we haven't oh, done you haven't, the whole thing. Oh, you haven't done the no, whole no, book. No, 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 no. It was really that uh, uh, we needed something to, to do here. So I did that. Well, <clears throat> how did you like the 2,000 words? What? How, how did you think of my 2,000 words? Well, I think, it, you know, it's very, um, it's a big question, in fact, for me. Uh, my book is going to be translated in uh, simplified Chinese um, and I'm very proud and happy about that and uh, yet we have no uh, translation in English plan. You have to know that very few books, uh, very few French books get to be translated in, uh, in uh, English that's the most difficult language to get when you're a French writer. For a lot of reason, uh, because there is a lot of good uh, writers in uh, the Anglophone world, of course, we all know that, because I think the American, uh, especially the American production, is quite, um, uh, is, at, is at the top of the game and define what novel is about today. And uh, the definition, the American definition of uh, what is a novel is very different from the French. Uh, it might be interesting to know that in France, uh, novel as uh, art form has been questioned a lot. Uh, in fact, it has been under a great deal of suspicion, really, uh, meaning that it was considered as some, some way like a very bourgeois, very fake art form. And so a lot of French writers since the 50s, even before, but s s very clearly since the 50s with uh, Le Nouveau Roman, the, the new novel, which is the big trend after the war in France, try to deconstruct what a novel is, to deconstruct the plot, to deconstruct the characters, to try to find new ways uh, to write a novel. I don't mean that in the English world this question about the modernity of novel doesn't exist. Of course it, it exists. I was telling this morning with, uh, to Peter that uh, some, somebody like Henry Miller was saying 
even before the war, that does a novel has to have a plot? His answer was no. We don't care about the plot. It's so it's full of conven convention. It's artificial, and so on. So the the novel today is in France is, I think, for the best and the worst, very um, uh, kind of a nombrilist center around your umbilic. Self-center, self-center. And um, somehow, I think the American publisher always say to the French publisher, come on guys, can you do a story? Can you do a proper story? Stop telling the world about your little self. Uh, it's so boring, it's so, we need, to, you know, the people, they need some, a plot. They need a real story, they need an adventure. And in France, to cut a long story short, it's more about the adventure of writing than writing adventure. So the, the kind of misunderstanding about what the novel is between the Anglophone world and the French world. That's one of the reasons that so few novels has been translated. And the one which has been translated very often looks or sounds a little bit like what is a proper novel in the, in the Anglophone world. So that's... Sorry, my answer is very long, but uh, there's a lot to say about that. And to translate the, 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 the experience we share mm. together, Peter and I, trying to translate just a, a few pages of my book, it was very uh, disturbing is not the, the right word because it's not, it did not, I, I was very comfortable, but it was very surprising, very surprising. Suddenly, I was reading something I didn't know. And it's, it's like uh, something that you, has been recreated. Uh, and that's, uh, that's, translation, it's very, very difficult, I think. From French to English, it's a big thing. It's a big issue. And really, I appreciate the effort of Peter, who did that uh, on, his, uh, on his own. It was a, a proposition you made to, to, to me. And uh, you succeed to make, make something different from my book. It was but, the intention. But something very valuable, very precious at the same time. So it's my book and not my book anymore. Maybe we should sign it together, the English version. I don't know. Well, you know, since I did it, I mean, I, did, I frankly did it pretty quickly because we, I felt that we needed something to read here and, yeah. and otherwise it wouldn't make much sense. And, uh, you know, I'm certainly not a professional translator or even a writer. Um, <clears throat> and I think after having read it out loud now, there are things I would change. I should okay. have read it out loud before. But what I think is um, interesting about the book and interesting about the process of translation is that sometimes, you know, people say a book speaks to you. You can hear the voice, you can hear what people are saying. And this book has that. It speaks to the reader uh, in a very particular way. And maintaining that in English is really hard because he's not speaking in English, he's speaking in French. And there are things that you can say in French, and it's not just things you can say, it's the way you say them, that in English you can't do. If you were to translate it word for word, it would be accurate, but the English would be terrible. And if you try to make the English good, it's not the French anymore, and it's different. Well, that's, that's the challenge. I, I recommend that you make some contact with your Chinese translator because otherwise he'll be, he'll be traveling in the dark. I will follow your advice for sure. I, I'm, I was going to, just following on from this question, I think one of the, um, 
I don't know whether this is that I haven't read very much French fiction. I haven't read very much since I was in school. But I really did feel the book felt different to me than the equivalent English books, novels about Hong Kong. Um, and I think at a superficial level, I mean, one, one of the things we can we talk about is Beverly, for example, is, is not the typical Asian woman in a book with Western men. She's not in the first blush of youth. And she has a child. Yeah, that's, that's what I was trying to say before about uh, the status of a uh, woman in Hong Kong. I wanted my, this character to be, um, to be strong, uh, to have a life, uh, not to be like a movie star, you know, oh, the, 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 the curse of being famous and being a movie star. That was not the subject of my book. The real subject of my book uh, was fascination. Our fascination can put at the distance, at a very uh, painful distance, the thing or the person you love the most. You know, if I, uh, maybe I could have found the possibility to live here in Hong Kong. And somehow I still want to try to find a way in the, fut in the future, maybe to live here. But maybe I was, I, I, I preferred to, to stay away, to keep the magic, to keep the fascination. But this way, you cut yourself from experience, from maybe happiness. That's my self-portrait, I guess. Any more questions? Um, your obsession um, about Hong Kong is very powerful um, and inexplicable. I'd like you to look back to your childhood. Uh, can you name um, an object of desire in your childhood? And do you see um, similarity in these two objects? Wow. <laughs> oh, that's a very surprising question. Um, an object of desire well, I don't know if I can say that in, in public. Um, okay, let's play that game. Um, when I was a kid, I was maybe six or seven. Uh, my grandmother uh, was a very modern uh, woman. As a younger uh, f female friends, and one of these friends, whose name was Hélène Page, who's kind of, it's, it's, a, it's a little bit of a destiny, because her name was Hélène Page, like a page. She was a model, she was maybe, I don't know, 20, 25, between 20 and 25, and she was working on, in France as a model. Uh, she was tall, very elegant, and she had dark black hair. And as a, as a boy, I was looking at her like, wow. So I don't know if that's the, the, the question that you, uh, you're asking me, but the, the, the first thing I can think about uh, in my childhood, of the first object of fascination, was in fact a woman, and uh, a, a dark hair, um, tall woman. Uh, and I don't know if it explains anything about my passion uh, for uh, Hong Kong, and, but maybe, I don't know. 
Is it that type of answer you were waiting for? But I'm not sure I quite understood the, your question, but it was very disturbing for me, in fact, in a good way, in a good way. Any more questions from the floor? Maybe, I guess, okay. The lady. Um, you have just mentioned that um, you love Hong Kong as you feel that women and the men is equal in this city. And that's, I, I, as my understanding of your sentence is that the social status are equal. But actually, uh, we all know men and women are different. So uh, emotionally, what is women difference to you in your eyes? That means difference from the men's not the biological status. Well, that's one of the questions I ask myself writing the, the female character of my book. What, it, what, what is the condition of a woman that, and I speak with a lot of uh, women about that, uh, what is this con special condition to, every day, to be under the, the eyes of everyone, but especially male? You have to know that in Paris, in Europe, in Italy, in France, in Spain, it's women are in a constant, uh, are constantly approach by men. I don't know if it's the case in Hong Kong. I don't know if it's the case at all. Maybe you, can, you could tell me about that. But you have to know that every day my, my friends, my female friends in France are telling me, you don't know what is to be a woman. A woman is walking in the streets and hearing some with whistle uh, having some men getting to you in a nice way or not so nice way, or do you want to have a coffee with me? And, and so on and so on and so on. And it's like being on stage. It's like being on, on, under the eyes of someone every day, all day long. And I ask to, to, uh, to, to my female friend, how do you deal with that? And they say, oh well, you have to forget about you have to, to, to forget about that. You have to get rid of that because if not, you cannot live. Uh, you you don't want to put yourself in t with a skirt because if you put a skirt, that you you know that the this type of proposition are going to be double. It's it's you know you have to to to. There's a lot of question about being on stage all the time, under the, the, the eyes of uh, all the men, and that's something I don't know because I'm not, a, I'm not a woman and I don't know what it is to be a woman. But I try to figure, I try to represent that condition. I don't know if that's my answer. My answer is what you uh, expected, but that's my best. <laughs> When I, um, <clears throat> I read the book, and before I'd met Olivier, I, 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 actually, I wrote a review of it, uh, which I'll, I'll read a little bit from now. I um, hope I was right when I wrote the review. We'll see. Um, and I think it relates to the conversation we've just had. I said that the protagonist in Repulse Bay is extraordinarily self-absorbed. He reflects continuously on his situation and state of mind, comments on the weather, the ambience, the food, and just about anything else. I suppose that one might consider this philosophical, except that he indulges in it to an extent that the apparent love of his life often seems to be pushed from his thoughts. Perhaps it's really the city he loves. Uh, the net effect is that there can seem to be sometimes rather more description, internal and external, than plot. It did strike me as a very analytical book. Um, the sort of conversation you just had is the, sign of, is the sort of thing I think the protagonist might have spoken to himself about in the book. Y 
Yeah. Um, yeah. I don't. I don't know exactly what to what to what to what to say to that because it's true that in a way, um, it's like a. It's like a. This book is like a diary. You said diary. diary. Um, it's like an everyday diary, uh, like a stream of consciousness in a very different way. Obviously, uh, I, d I don't want to compare myself to Proust, but is the inventor, Proust with a search of lost time, is the inventor of that type of kind of mental monologue. And my protagonist is pretty much in this situation of trying to follow the the, his mental path. But at the same time, this is a curse. This is a malediction. Because he cannot live, really, the moment. And at the end of the book, maybe he's able to break the glass, to break these things that impeach him to be happy and to meet the other and to meet the one he loves. And all the story of the book, it's about breaking the glass and being able to be happy. That's it. If I may, who's the lady in the front cover, in the page cover? Oh, that's a choice of my publisher. And I think it was a very good choice. But the first choice of my publisher was a picture of Gong Li. But it was too expensive, <laughs> as you can imagine. So I don't know, she's, I, I don't think she's from Hong Kong, in fact. Uh, she might be Malaysian, she's a model. And uh, that's, that was a surprise for me, but that, it, was, it, it was, I thought it was a good representation of the question of the book. This woman into her uh, own, uh, image. Uh, it's all about that. And uh, well, I think it was a good choice. Anyone has questions? Uh, well, it's an easy question. Um, I know you were a student of art history, right? Yes. And uh, you, your first love was music. So I want to ask, why did you um, change from, from writing music into writing books? And uh, how did you feel? And thank you. Um, I stopped making music because I lost my passion for music. It's like when a love story ends. You cannot exactly explain why, but this passion was was very important in my life. Um, suddenly, it was not working anymore. And I felt very, very lost and empty when this passion ended. And I was kind of, whoa, what am, um, what am I going to do? S shall I pretend to do some music? S you know, not with my heart, but just with the skills I have just to make, make a living. That's what I used to do for 20 years. I, I made a, li a living writing music. I did some feature films. I did some songs. I did some uh, advertising. Everything a composer must do to make a living. And suddenly, I lost the passion. So I have been in a desert for some time. <laughs> And it was like a re really empty desert. And uh, I found, and it was something I didn't premedita premeditate, I found writing. And somehow I found a new language which was possible for me. And I've been lucky enough to have a good reception with my first book. And I feel really blessed uh, to, be, to have been able to switch from my first passion, uh, music, to, uh, to writing uh, uh, 
books. But writing music or writing books, it's writing. It's try to compose something. And some people who read French, who read my book in French, uh, told me it was very musical. It was very uh, atmospheric. It was very... Um, uh, it was a type of writing that, uh, that was coming from music. So I don't know if it's true, but I, I take it as a compliment. And uh, that's what maybe music gave me uh, to write uh, literature. It gave me a sense of music, of melody, and a sense of composition. Uh, so, as you have been to two very important art forms, music and art, um, I guess there's a visual art. So, can you just maybe read a paragraph from your book, which you find is really musical, and also another piece, maybe an, uh, an, another paragraph that you find it is really like, a, you know, Gomin Beng Du, it's just like a picture or like a, like a painting. Can you read it to us? And maybe we can close our eyes and listen to the musical one, whether we can feel the musical sense of that paragraph, maybe that, that would be fine. I, I think it's, it's good for, for atmosphere like this, you know. I'm, I'm going uh, I'm gonna to read you something about the city, um, and maybe after the buildings, uh, but something about the city, something about the, the, what I call in French, la fraternité anonyme que peut donner la ville. Uh, anonyme fraternity would be a, a translation possible? Not sure. Anonymous Brotherhood. But the fraternity is more than brotherhood. It means uh, bonding. Bonding, yeah. Je me laisse amadouer par la douceur du matin et je vais courir autour du Victoria Peak puisque décidément il fait trop froid pour nager. L'absolue beauté du paysage rend la course facile. J'ai encore l'odeur de Beverly sur moi et l'échauffement de mon corps en développe les effluves mêlées. Le chemin serpente au-dessus de la ligne sommitale des immeubles, construits en contrebas. La pente du pic permet d'appréhender leur verticalité à différentes hauteurs. C'est d'ailleurs une particularité de Hong Kong. La hauteur y est toujours relative, ambiguë, le sommet toujours proche du sol. Je tends mon esprit vers la ville implacable, la lumière, la rumeur, et vers l'océan tout autour qui est encore la ville. C'est elle que je respire, c'est elle que je sens pulser comme mon sang. Le temps d'un éblouissement, mes liens avec elle sont aussi tangibles, aussi enveloppants que si quelqu'un me prenait dans ses bras. Le vrai trésor de la vie est à portée de main, une fraternité anonyme et sans visage. J'arrête ma course, essayant de prolonger ce sentiment tant que j'ai le cœur d'y croire. Sur les pentes du pic, derrière les murs, les clôtures de sécurité, on devine des villas de plusieurs dizaines de millions de dollars et les limites du partage. Le cynisme à mes trousses, je reprends ma course. Another excerpt. This is like a painting, or this piece that you have read is like a music piece. It's musical, or I, I, I really don't know. I, it feels a little bit musical for me, but I'm not sure. For but because you have read it too fast, it's like the life in Hong Kong. I'm, so, so, I'm sorry. I didn't know that you were speaking French, in fact. Okay. okay. Uh, and I would say that's atmospheric like a painting. That's okay. my view. It's very um, descriptive and there are, there's a, um, visual images in that and lines and verticalities and, and atmosphere. So I would have thought that was like a painting, my, my guess. Do you want me to read the, the exception? In the 
Yeah, that I, buildings. You have this one, I leave by the way. Is, is that where it starts? Did you read it in English or I read it in French? You read it in French. So, so you can under, this is easy to understand because it's all. Je sors du magasin par un labyrinthe de galeries vitrées et climatisées pour rejoindre le jardin botanique. Il est entouré d'immeubles que je connais par leur nom, comme des amis assis autour d'une table. Il y a le Centrium, The Center, le prétentieux Entertainment Building, Hanley, les jumeaux Landmark Gloucester, le géant et lointain IFC, Standard Chartered, HSBC, Bank of China, père et fils, le grand Chung Kong, le sombre Citibank, l'étrange Murray. Les tours abritent les arbres, les protègent des entrées maritimes. Peu de conséquences visibles de l'ouragan sur les plantations de ce côté de la ville. Des décennies de colonisation anglaise ont travaillé le paysage de l'île en la dotant d'un réseau de drainage, de réservoirs, de parcs naturels, de chemins de randonnée. Ciment et bitume ont conquis les pentes des collines, ont serré les arbres, comblé les talus. Le béton et la végétation se sont conjugués, finissant par échanger leurs qualités essentielles. Ici, nul besoin de choisir. C'est peut-être pour cela que j'aime autant cette ville. So I think that the first part certainly has a rhythm to it, a syncopated rhythm. But one of, one of the things about, I, I, I think it's easy, you can understand what it's about, you don't have to understand French. But there are one or two lines in there which in the French are really very nice. One of them are the um, Landmark and Gloucester twins, which is a nice line. And the other thing that I, the other one that I think is is very nice is he talks about the Bank of China, père et fils, which literally means father and son. Okay, and it, it's this it's the way you, you there, there are all these companies in France that are such and such père et fils, you know. So it's a very common expression, father father and son, in French, and it, and in, I don't know in English you'd say what, junior and senior, something like that. So I've never heard, you, we talk about the new, new Bank of China building, the old Bank of China building, but to talk of them as being father and son or junior and senior is, is a kind of, a, is a very nice expression. And one of those things you just can't translate. I don't know what you do about it. Just a short suggestion, uh, the relationship between the old Bank of China and the new Bank of China building, you can compare them with, uh, because the old one is uh, built with rocks, stones, and the new one is made of metals. Uh, uh, you can compare that, uh, you can have the analogy that the old one is, a, is an old guy, but uh, with intelligence and experience, but the uh, new metallic buildings, long one, 76 story, is uh, energetic. <laughs> is okay. energetic. Energetic. Okay. Any questions from the floor? I think many, okay. The men. I don't know much about the play do Premier Roma the price. Uh, can you introduce a little bit about this and the relation about your book, which got this prize? Do you mean the award? Yeah, the award. Um, as you know, we have, a, we have several passions in France. We have a passion for theory. That's why uh, the theory of novel is so important in France, which is not, as you explained to me, Peter, in the Anglophone world. And we have another passion, it's literary prize. We have thousands of literary prize. But every, uh, every September, every October and November, this is a big season for literary prize. And every year in France, uh, we have maybe 15, or not even, let's say, between uh, 10 and 15 important prizes. Uh, we, we have the Goncourt. Maybe you heard about the Goncourt because it's the biggest one. And we have several prize, prizes like, like this. And it's quite, 
a big thing to be part of the list of the prize. So every September you got the list of the prize and I've been lucky enough to be in two lists. One was the Prix de Flore. Uh, le Café de Flore is a very famous cafe uh, at Saint-Germain uh, in Paris. And so I was uh, listed in this one, and I was listed in this uh, quite old prize because it's uh, the, the Prix du Premier Roman, the first novel award, was created uh, 40 years ago, almost 40 years ago, by an um, author, a well respected author, and some journalist. And uh, so it's a, it's a game very French game to be part of this, uh, um, uh, of these prizes and to try to win one of these prizes. Um, my publisher was not at all in a, a big publisher, so we, it was a big surprise for, for them and for me because not, we, we did nothing to try to you know, to make our way in this competitive world of the literary prize in France. It was a very, very good surprise. So, that's it. Any more questions from the floor? If there is no more questions, this is the end of the seminar, and copies of Mr. Olivier uh, Lebet's books are available for purchase at the counter outside. And Mr. LaBear also welcomed book lovers to line up in the center aisle for autographs. So thank you so much, Mr. LaBear, for his sharing of this wonderful Thanks story. So on behalf of KTDC, we also thank everyone for joining today. So we hope you have an enjoyable afternoon and enjoyable visit to our fair today.